Good evening and welcome to Delco Arts Week at home. I'm Tom Kelly and I'm broadcasting streaming live from the Kelly Center in Havertown, Pennsylvania. Um, the Kelly Center is home to the New Avenue Cafe. Uh, we're open by day as a cafe and we do shows in here at night, a variety of different kinds of shows. Also joining me uh, on the screen tonight and uh, on, the, on the virtual stage, I have uh, Eric Thompson and Jared Loss. Uh, we're gonna take you on a tour of the arts in Delco and give you an opportunity to meet some of the people behind the scenes in the arts in Delco. So I will hand it off to these guys and uh, let them take it from here. Thanks, Tom. Hey, Delaware County, how are you? Uh, I'm Eric Thompson, I'm the executive director of Darlington Art Center. And I'm Jared Loss, and I am the owner, manager, and teacher here at Rockdale Music and Studios. So we are coming from we are coming live from Rockdale Music and Studios, deep in the heart of Delco in Aston, Pennsylvania, right now. And I will let you know that we just threw Jared into this a few minutes ago. I needed a co-host. I was insistent that we had one. So uh, Jared has reluctantly and uh, enthusiastically been joining I'm us I'm the man to you. I'm your Ed Big man. Ha, ha, ha. It's gonna be perfect, I can't wait. Sorry for this, this is how we are typically. So this is, you're just getting a glimpse into how all of our meetings go once a week with the Delaware uh, County Arts Consortium. So thank you for joining us tonight. We're so excited to be here um, to provide you this virtual tour of the county and the arts and culture sector of our county through this next 90 minutes or so. our own organizations, and then we've mixed in a bunch of videos that are interviews and snippets of the performances and the presentations that we've been able to offer virtually in Delco Arts uh, this, this week that are if something catches your interest tonight, go on DelcoArts.org and check it out, and then look at the other 50 events that we have going on. So we're gonna get started. Yes. Uh, first, we wanna thank our, our sponsors for Double Arts Week. This is our second annual year, and this is the second annual time that the sponsors have uh, provided assistance with us. So you're gonna see two wonderful interviews with Francis Sheehan, who is the president of the Foundation for Delaware County. Uh, and then we're gonna, we're gonna throw it back to Tom. So Tom, let's see Francis. Well, hey everyone out there in Delaware County, this is Eric Thompson from Darlington Arts Center, who's also part of Delco Arts Week as your host today as we take a tour out of Delaware County. And I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have this moment to have a conversation with Frances Sheehan from the Foundation for Delaware County. Welcome, Frances. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm thrilled to be included. Well, it's great to see you. I'm sorry that we're doing it this way. You know, this time last year, I think we caught each other at many of the events, but mm -hmm. um, I'm happy that at least we get to reconnect virtually through this mm -hmm. really wonderful week. Um, Francis, would you mind telling everyone that's watching uh, what the Foundation for Delaware County, how it came to be and what it's all about? Sure. Okay. So the Foundation for Delaware County was created four years ago and we inherited the um, uh, nonprofit assets of the Crozier Keystone Health System and we're an independent uh, community foundation serving all of Delaware County. And we've been to get dedicated from the beginning to creating a vibrant community by encouraging philanthropy and collaboration and communication across all sorts of sectors in our, in our county. So that does mean making grants to support nonprofits, but we also look for opportunities to bring nonprofits together. So when we were presented with the idea of uh, sponsoring the Delco Arts Week, uh, I guess it was, gosh, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, we agreed that was a perfect opportunity for the Foundation for Delaware County to step forward. And we uh, partnered with the um, Delco, Visit Delco, the Visitors Bureau, uh, to make that happen last year. And then it was so successful last year and could see the potential for growth. Um, and so we agreed to do it again this year. And we also underwrite our region's public uh, television and radio station, WHYY, and we use that as an opportunity to let our listeners know about Delco Arts Week, and we're so pleased that despite the pandemic that you're up and running again this year, albeit mostly virtually. 
as are we. And um, uh, thank you so much for the second year of sponsoring. That's you know, on behalf of all of our members, we're really uh, thrilled and uh, excited to partner with you. And we heard the, uh, at least I did, I heard the WHY ad today, and it was a thrilling thing to hear Delco Arts Week yeah. when you're driving on the, driving mm -hmm. to the Wakeman. So mm -hmm. it was very exciting. Wonderful. Um, Francis, you know, I'm cheating because you and I know each other a little bit better through the through this partnership. So I know that you're an arts fan. Um, what is it about the arts that is important to you? And how does that come into the organization or the mission? Mm. So I just think it's a critical part of a healthy community. I mean, it's not just my opinion. It's it's uh, our whole team just really values the arts, whether it's music, uh, the the um, painting, visual. Um, it's really just such an integral part of a vibrant community. And I really admire the creativity that artists bring to their work. It's not who I am. Uh, my son is a musician. My dad was, all he ever listened to was symphony, symphony, symphonies. And so I love music. I just, I think it's how you, um, I, I, it's just how, it, I can't imagine a world in which, where we didn't have the arts. And I know how underfunded it is and how unappreciated it can be by um, sort of the forces of, um, of uh, you know, business sometimes. But when businesses invest in the arts, individuals, foundations, and you use the arts to invigorate communities and to allow artists to speak um, with their creative spirit, I think it's incredibly inspiring. That's wonderful. Um, I know that we, uh, this past year we had the opportunity um, through Darlington and through the county that had a really special moment for our visual artists across the county where um, your office is adorned with local artists. Do you want to speak on that a little bit? Well, that was really wonderful. We had several arts organizations that came forward and um, lent us some artwork that's throughout the, our main headquarters suite in media. Unfortunately, we, even though I'm here right now, and I do try to come in sometimes, for most of, um, we mostly don't have any visitors here, of course, because of the, of the virus. But we're looking forward to showcasing local artists at our headquarters in media in the future. And I uh, think that's a really important role that we can play in the community because we often have people coming in and out for trainings and programs and, and meetings, and it's a way to expose them to the arts as well. Yeah, and it is much appreciated to get the um, to get that exposure for these artists who may not always have a space to go. And you know, it's a great conversation starter. And mm -hmm. being in your boardroom, it's a great way to see the visuals anyway. Uh, you know, you mentioned that your father was a musician and that your son's a musician. Do you have an art memory or, uh, you know, something that you can, that sparks um, your passion for the arts? Well, my dad was not a musician, but he oh. loved music. He was an aficionado, I should say. One of the, <laughs> my last things that I did for him before he passed away was to take him to a Philadelphia Orchestra concert that he had never been to. He was new to the area and it was, um, he was just riveted. It was really wonderful. I, I think that um, whenever you walk into an art space, I think of um, visiting London and going into the British Museum and, and there's a giant wall size painting of Lady Jane Grey in prison and it's just so arresting or where you have the opportunity to go to the Philadelphia Museum and see Aiken's uh, surgery, you know, his two paintings of, of surgery rooms is just amazing. Um, but even locally, when I walk into the MG Free Theater and I see local artists like Devin Walls, that whole artist warehouse network that he's developed in Chester, I think you just, you, you just, it causes you to step back and just sort of slow everything down and just, you know, really just breathe in the creativity that goes into the work. And on one hand, you're slowing it down and breathing it in the creativity. And on the other hand, it sort of jazzes you up and you just, oh my God, look at all this, you know, ingenuity right in front of me. And I just, a lot of different situations like that, that I've been in that really, um, you know, walking into Mac, you know, the, the Media Arts Council, when there's a photography exhibit and you know, meeting the artists. And, and I loved last year in Delco Arts Week that the 
studio tour was part of it because you got to go into the artist studios and I ended up um, buying a piece of Alan Soffer's work for myself that's hanging in my office that I just I just love. I wish I could I could show it to you because just looking at it every day just inspires me. Lots of different memories, not one particular one, but yeah. lots of different memories that um, where I can't even articulate exactly what I was feeling when I when I saw it, but I knew it was special. That's I mean I I completely agree with you. I think art is it's a mood stabilizer, it's a mood enhancer, it's the way you, each day it can be impacted in small and big mm -hmm. ways. And you, mm -hmm. your uh, purchase of local artists actually inspired me. The, the piece behind me is Lois Schlechter from Art 504. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was when I went into your office, I'm like, I really should have some art in my space too. So <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah. Um, you know, last year, as we mentioned, was a really fun time. I think we had about 35 events and you know, we had a, a, a kind of tongue in cheek competition going on between some of us uh, arts leaders, Jared Loss at the Rockdale Arts District and I were trying to be the person who was at the most uh, events that we could. And we found out that <laughs> you, in fact, Francis, won. You were at the most <laughs> events last year. So, you know, looking at, I don't know if you've, I hope that you've had a chance to look at delcoarts.org. Are there any um, virtual events that you that you saw that seem really interesting or that you're excited to partake in? Well, I actually, I, I'm embarrassed to admit because I have looked at the site, but I, what I need to do, which I did last year, which is why I got to go to so many events, was literally sat down with my calendar in the website and I went through every single event where that was happening and I put what I could squeeze in and what I was interested in into my calendar. And that's on my list to do this week, so I'm prepared for Saturday. I just haven't done it yet, but I, I so admire that everybody has stepped up and that everybody's trying to do something virtually, or there's a few things that are outside socially distanced that I noticed. Um, and I think that's great too. I think, um, I think there'll be a lot of really wonderful opportunities. And I have to say my husband and I participated in a Philly fringe festival event uh, the other night. It was um, the three mag magicians who had their piece was featured in the New York times actually. And, there were 17 pages on the Zoom screen of 25 people on each screen. So you're talking over 400 people wow. who were there watching this. And it was so riveting. And they managed to incorporate some, you know, interaction. And then um, at the end, they panned in on everybody. And you just really felt the, just the power of the audience and how much we all are so longing to be in person again. and. I'm hoping that that will be next year. And but meanwhile, we're going to be looking for opportunities to do things meaningfully virtually. And I really applaud all of you for stepping up and trying to make that happen. And I'm looking forward to seeing how, in some instances, that might even be better than being in person. We'll see. Yeah, we're, we're trying to find the positive spins of it too. You know, mm -hmm. perpetuity. We'll be able to keep these videos, and uh, it'll be part True. of our history for forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Francis, Francis, thank you once again for the support that you and the Foundation for Delaware County have brought to Duckle Arts and Duckle Arts Week. Um, we're so appreciative of that. And we're so appreciative that you took the time today to chat with me. Um, you know, is there anything else you'd like to say? Just to say that it's my pleasure. It's my honor. I know our board of directors and our whole team are just um, so grateful to have the opportunity to support your work. And we're looking forward to Delco Arts Week growing for years to come. That's what we hope for too. Thank you, Francis. We're big My fans pleasure. of you too. <laughs> Thanks so much. Take care. Francis Sheehan. And we are all so grateful to Francis and her team for the support that they have given to Delco Arts Week and uh, just to support the arts in Delaware County. I'm Tom Kelly from Kelly Music for Life. And we are a member of the Delco Arts Consortium. And uh, we're proud to be uh, part of this event this week. Uh, we have several events going on. We actually kicked off Delco Arts Week here at the Kelly Center in Havertown uh, this past Saturday. If you're not familiar with the Kelly Center, we are uh, a, a product of Kelly Music for Life, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, here in the Kelly Center on Eagle Road in Havertown, we run a cafe by day, the New Avenue Cafe that's run by Jim Worcester. And the, um, the cafe creates work opportunities for people with different abilities. So if you come in here during the day for a cup of coffee, 
you're helping in a number of different ways. And then at night we do shows. Uh, we have a couple more shows lined up for the rest of Delco Arts Week and then um, more shows through the end of the year with limited audience, of course, in this time that we're in right now. This past Saturday, we had an event in here with a very talented performer who has uh, performed on our stages around Haverford Township and concerts in the park, music festivals, uh, Christine Havrilla. Now, Christine, if you don't know Christine, she's battling uh, metastatic breast cancer, so she's vulnerable. And she said, look, I'd love to do a show that's not inside my house. I'd love to get out on the stage someplace, um, and I'd like to do it there, but we don't, I don't want any people inside. So we accommodated her. Um, and what we did was we opened up the sliding glass doors on the front of the building and a congregation of people started to happen on the sidewalks. So I'm, you know, we had 25 or 30 people out there who knew that she was on stage and were cheering for her. It was a, it was a terrific night. So I'd like to go to a, a clip from, from that show this past Saturday night with Chris, Christine Havrilla. so very much for this program. Oh, 
All right, hi everyone, this is Eric Thompson from Darlington Arts Center. I'm here with Steve Byrne, the Executive Director of Visit Delco PA, one of the sponsors of Delco Arts Week, and a great friend. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Eric, I appreciate you having me here. I appreciate you taking the time. I know this is a busy time, uh, especially now that we're kind of coming back uh, as much as we can. Um, you know, we're really appreciative of the support as we've changed our model for Duckle Arts Week, and we look forward to showing you what we've got. <laughs> I'm looking forward week. to seeing it. I was just on the website too, looking at all the venues that are that are coming up, and for 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 being locked. In, I'll say, not locked down, but so you guys got a lot going on. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Well, yeah, no one should ever underestimate artists. We always get creative, don't we? Absolutely. <laughs> Steve, you know, um, can you give a kind of a little synopsis on what Visit Delco PA is all about and what what you guys are here for? Sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, you know, our name is Visit Delco PA. We're the official tourism promotion agency of Delco County. And, and we're, we're tasked with bringing um, visitors into the county. And we focus on three main areas. It's, it's, it's hotels, restaurants, and attractions. And, um, you know, the, old, the arts fits right in there with, with attractions. And, um, you know, uh, Eric, you guys have, had asked me, I, I guess it's been two years now that uh, you came knocking at my door with, with with you and Harry Giesler and Becky Robert and, and the original crew, Jane and Jen, and came in and, and I'm like, all right, what are you guys here for? And it was like, started explaining to me um, that at that time you had about 25 different members that formed this consortium and you wanted to start promoting it, the, the arts in, in Delaware County. And, you know, I stepped back and I started thinking about that meeting. And, um, right before that meeting, and I told this story to you in the past, and I'm, I'm gonna tell it again right now because it kind of fits with, with what we're doing here. Um, we we had a, a board retreat meeting, and we went off site, um, had all board members sit down, we had a facilitator there, and she asked the question, what is that we And the big thing that came out of that by everybody in that room was history and art. We're just rich in arts, rich in history. And when you guys came in and sat down and asked us to get involved, it was like a, a, a no brainer. It was a situation where I'm like, these guys are gonna get together, promote the arts, we're, we're behind it. We're behind it hundred uh, percent. To see it have grown through the years, the two years now, is it, are, are we, am I right, two years now? Yeah, this is our second year. Second year. Um, to see how the organizations have come together, the people that have joined your group and the and now to see what's going on. And unfortunately, we have to do it virtually this year, but it's just amazing to see how this group has grown. And we, we could not be more um, happy to be involved with you guys and support it. We appreciate that, Stephen. We can't be, we couldn't be happier to, uh to have a better partner in, in this realm, you know, uh, it's been a really great ride. Um, Steve, I'm curious, I don't know this about you, are you an artist of any way, or do, <laughs> just do, do you have any secret talents that we don't know about? Um, let's put it this way, I don't think I've got an artistic bone in my body. Um, <laughs> I, I, growing up, I, I could never draw a picture, I could never do a painting, and um, it, it was frustrating at, at, at times. But as I got older, I've really come to appreciate the, the people that have that talent that can sit there and see an image and draw or take a nice photograph and, and present it. And, you know, it's, it, it's, somebody said, well, what, what's your favorite art? And th there's two things. I, I love watching people paint. I just love watching a blind piece of paper becoming a, a beautiful image there and just, you know, just stroke and whatever they do. Yeah. But the other thing, the other one that really gets me is performing arts. And, and I, I realized this, I was at the media theater a couple of years ago, a, a play that was written by Ray Dittinger, uh, Tommy, oh, yeah. I remember. Tommy McDonald. And I sat in the audience and just watched 
those actors and actresses and I said, oh my gosh, to memorize their lines, to, to act and portray it. It's just a talent that I never had. And 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 I laugh when you say to me, do you have any art? I, I, I respect those those artists that have that talent. I just didn't have it. I I was an outdoors guy. I was I played sports and you know, but the older I get, the more I appreciate that artistic ability. That's great. No, and I, you know, Ray Dittinger, I remember he did the media theater, then he went over to Players Club of Swarthmore and did a one-man show. And then Glenn yeah. Mack now is now performing with Players Club of Swarthmore from time to time. So it's been really fun to see the, the sports world come into the theatrical world as well. And actually, and it's funny, I, I learned a lot about, listening to that play, I learned how, how Ray grew up and all that stuff. It was really, yeah. really interesting. And, well, that's the beauty of that's the beauty of theater. I think you know a lot of times it's just storytelling, and that's where it comes from. And you know, yep. Steve, you can pick up the paintbrush. There's still time. We know a lot of arts organizations in this county, so <laughs> I've tried it. You'll want to see it, <laughs> Steve. You said you looked at the website. Was there anything that caught your interest? Is are you excited about any particular thing this week? You know, it, it's funny because the, the one area I told you about that I really like are the. Um, um, paintings and, and I did notice there was a, a photography one in there and and that that is something I tried to get into photography just haven't had the time to really get into it um I know when I graduated college years ago my parents bought me a nice uh camera that I, I started taking pictures with but I just never had the time to really get to that point where you can you see it and and I love looking at photographs Especially photographs of places that I've been, and to see how yeah. people capture a special image. And uh, I am I'm going to actually look at those those uh, webinar Zoom meetings and just um, see what's out there. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's you know again again Eric, it's it's just seeing people be able to just take stuff and, and put it on whatever it may be a uh, a photograph or I've seen people paint on tiles, canvas, and, and just just like image your background right there. I bet you if I stared at that, I, there would be a message coming out of that. Yeah, this is so a I this is a doco, this is a local artist too. It's Lois Schlachter. She's part of Art 504 in Chester. Oh okay. So, and um she's one of she's one of my favorite artists. So I like to awesome. showcase her as much as I can. <laughs> Now, just gave her some publicity. How about yeah, that? well, you know, that's what this is all about, right? <laughs> uh, well, Steve, you know, on behalf of the entire consortium, we're so grateful for yours and Visidoco PA's support in making this week happen. Uh, we look forward to this week. And the greatest part about the virtual is that all of this stuff will stay. So if you miss that photography uh, Zoom live, you can you can find it on DocoArts.org throughout the rest of the year. So that's, that's awesome. a great thing. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the time, and we look forward to seeing you in person soon. You got it. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Eric. Take care. You, right? Fun fact, if you were listening closely, I actually referenced sports at least once in that Steve Byrne interview. <laughs> so that's pretty good. My brother's pretty proud right now. Thanks, Glenn Macnow. Um, thanks so much, Steve and Francis, uh, for your support and from the Foundation of Delaware County and uh, Visit Delco PA. We're really grateful for the sponsorship this year and we hope we're doing you proud. Uh, Jared, I think we're going to go down to Media Line Road right now in okay. Town Square at Delaware County Community College. Their gallery is featuring Rico Gaston power portraits on a virtual version of their Spring 2020 exhibition. Now, Rico Gaston is a multimedia visual artist whose work explores themes of history, identity, popular culture, and spirituality through sculpture, painting, video, and public art projects. His work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including exhibitions at the Studio Museum in Harlem, New York, and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, the Essel Museum, Vienna, Austria, and the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. In 2019, Gaston, completed a large commission for MTA Arts and Design entitled Beacons, eight permanent large scale mosaics of prominent figures associated with and installed in a subway station in the Bronx. Well, now I wanna go there, yeah. but we're San Adoko. His work is featured in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Denver Art Museum, 
the Cheekwood Museum, the Kempner Museum, and the Yale University Art Gallery. His work is also included in numerous private collections, but we had him right here in Delco this spring. And we're happy to show you a little clip of what that gallery looked like over at Delaware Community College. So fun fact, fun fact. I actually went to Delaware County Community College for uh, for a, a full sem a, a semester. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, great. And you know what? I learned how to do college at Delaware County Community <laughs> College because my first two semesters before Delaware County Community College, uh, not great. Yeah, it's not a, great grade wise. It's a beacon of light in Delaware County. Yes. Um, right. Thanks for sharing that uh, from the gallery at Delaware Community College. Uh, now we're going to get to know one of our hosts. Jared Loss. Jared, we're sitting in Rockdale Music and Studios right now, right? Yes, yep. This is our brand new space. Uh, we've been here since June, been renovating for the past couple months and just starting to get back the, do the doors back open again. It is. I mean, it's awesome. It's like right next to, what is this, Chester Creek? The wild Chester Creek. It is amazing. Um, Jared, you know, uh, I'm curious, what when did it spark for you that music and art was for you? So actually, uh, Going back to your sports, uh, <laughs> your sports. That's twice. Uh, yeah, yeah. Twice. Yeah. I was more of an athlete, actually, in, in high school. Wrestled, uh, played ice hockey and lacrosse, um, but always played music. All my good friends were musicians. I was kind of the, uh, like, the, the understudy on most of the, most of my friends as musicians. They were just incredible musicians. Most of them ended up studying in college. Um, so I... I was kind of a late bloomer with mm -hmm. music. It was more in college that I uh, decided to really like start practicing seriously. And uh, I guess always had a little bit of a natural yeah. knack for it, but uh, it, took, it took committing myself to playing. And uh, that was in college. And then I really never looked back after that. So, so when did Rockdale music come into play? So uh, after college, I moved out to California for a couple of years and I worked for a PBS documentary series called Road Trip Nation. Awesome. And uh, we drove all around the country doing um, d interviewing people who were passionate about what they did for a living. And it's when I kind of decided I decided I needed to do music for a living and figure out how to make music work for me. So I'm, when I moved back home, um, I started working for making music. Uh, rock and rhythms. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I was uh, I was working for Kim Fink from Making Music, uh, and she had already started Rockdale Music actually. So I started as a substitute teacher at Rockdale. Um, a couple months into that, she she decided she didn't, didn't wasn't going to continue with Rockdale. So uh, I went home, wrote a business plan to save Rockdale, and took it over. And 11, 12 years I later, say. I haven't run into the ground yet. So <laughs> That's you know, awesome. Not bad. And we all return to Delco, don't we? That's right. I, yep. Can't take the boy out. Yeah. Jared, what's going on? What's going on? Well, I, actually, I wanted to ask you real quick. Um, Rockdale Music is part of the Rockdale Arts District. T yes. Tell me a little bit about the district here. Yeah. So the Rockdale Arts District, we're, uh, we're a coalition or a consortium of artists. Uh, nice word. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, in the this small community in Aston, Pennsylvania, pretty much right in between Aston and Middletown Township. Um, along the Chester Creek, we have artists of all all mediums um, and music and and 
just some amazing, amazing talent right here. So we're, we've just working together to promote each other and awesome. lift each other up. You know, high tide rises all boats. That's, that's kind of that's amazing. What I love, we're I love that. Although high tide yeah. by the creek, we we don't want yeah. we, we no, don't want it to go yeah, up. You're on a hill. Yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. We're pretty guys. <laughs> Uh, Jared, what's going on? What are you guys doing for Duck Rx Week at Rockdown Music? So we actually had uh, live streams with our rock bands for Monday through Wednesday. We had uh, five different bands do live streams, so you can check them out on our YouTube page, our YouTube channel, and our Facebook page. Yeah. Um, and we're going to be doing a, a studio tour, a virtual studio tour, to take to so show off our new space. Sweet. Um, and probably Sunday, or yeah. we might be we might be late for uh, for Delco Arts Week. Delco Post Week, Delco Arts Week, Post Week, which you can always find at Delco Arts. That's right. <laughs> yes, Jared, that's wonderful. I'm so glad I know you now. Yeah, this is great. This is this is great. Now you have so, to ask me questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. That's right. <laughs> no one's heard enough from me tonight. You know? <laughs> All right. So Eric. Oh yeah. Yeah. Tell me about what you do with, uh, with that over at Del uh, Darlington Arts Center. So Darlington Arts Center is in Garden Valley, Pennsylvania, right on the edge of the county. We're stone's throw from Wilmington, Delaware. We're stone's throw from Chester County. And we are the first uh, arts organization in the state to do music, art, dance, and drama under one roof. It's an amazing spot. Yeah. And the space is amazing. Yeah, so it used to be a farm. Yeah. Uh, it was a Carter Farms, and then we built the art center on it. So the barn is still there in its structure. Uh, and then we have five acres of ground. So we do uh, music lessons, we do visual art classes, preschool programs, uh, drama classes, let's see, dance classes throughout the year. It's a really great place uh, for that region. And then we also have some outreach programs that come out into Chester and into Chester County. Oh, great. Yeah. What's your background in the arts? Well, I, I did not do sports. Well, no, that's a lie. I was forced to do sports until sixth grade. And okay. then in seventh grade, I found the Upper Darby Summer Stage. And that's when uh, my life kind of changed. Uh, I was a weird kid. I mean, I guess I just didn't really know my place. And um, Summer Stage really helped me find that. I think the arts can really do that for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, drank that Kool-Aid and ran with it. I studied music theater in college, performed for a little bit. I also toured the country, not in the same cool way. I was in a, a white van with seven other performers and we performed Willy Wonka, but we still got to see hey, the country for a while. That's, um, ours was not much more glamorous. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I will tell you that. Some jalopy RVs going yeah. all around the country. So. It's great. We both scared the children out of the country. <laughs> um, and then I you know, did the New York thing and then I decided that I didn't really like performing. So I started teaching and then I did that for 10 years. And Darlington kind of just fell into place. Uh, I was at a time in my life where I just kind of really liked what arts administration did and yeah. I could have a nine to five and I found it. And that's that's yeah. where I showed up. Nothing more rewarding than teaching yeah. and bring it, giving it to the next generation. It's amazing. It's, yeah. And it's, you know, now it's, <laughs> as, we're, as we're getting older, seeing my students become professionals and I still like, live within this area. And, and now I've actually been able to hire a couple of my old students as teaching artists, yeah. which is really, really yeah. awesome. Yeah. It, that all of our camp counselors are former students. <laughs> yeah, so, that's, so, great. That's, so that's how it works. Yeah. yeah they'll be taken over one day. <laughs> You'll be on these videos once <laughs> soon. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have a little bit of a, a tour of Darlington. Um, we're doing a lot of videos throughout the week, but this is just a little idea of what Darlington's all about. Hi and welcome. My name is Eric Thompson and I am coming to you from Garnet Valley, Pennsylvania to celebrate Delco Arts Week and to welcome you to Darlington Arts Center, your home for every art for everyone. Come on inside. Founded in 1978 by Diana Hemingway, Darlington has fostered a mission to build community by providing every art for everyone. For our 40th anniversary, we took to the community and asked them to tell us what the arts mean to them. As a result, as you enter the doors of Darlington, you catch a glimpse of exactly that in a beautiful mural constructed by Rebecca D'Angeli and the community members of Darlington Arts Center. Darlington Arts Center is thrilled to provide an arts integrated preschool program for our little ones at ages three to K. This is the home base and the preschool room here at Darlington, but because of social distancing cues, we are using our larger space throughout the day now. But still, this is a wonderful place for our little ones to come and get creative, as you can even see on the entranceway on the door here from our first week of preschool this year. 
Darlington offers programs in music, art, dance, and drama every day of the week, every day of the year. So I thought I'd take you around and show you the different rooms that we have here at Darlington for those programs. So first is our painting studio where we do most of our 2D projects for all ages, kids, teens, and adults. It's in here that we have drawing and painting classes, some portraiture classes and workshops, and beyond. It's also a great place to grab our inspiration as we also have a mural in here by Erica Mattia, one of our wonderful teaching artists, who for our 40th anniversary gave us her interpretation of every art for everyone. This is our dance studio where we offer programs in ballet, jazz, tap, lyrical, and hip hop all through the week for all ages. This is also the space where we provide our recitals and our coffee house series, bringing in some local and featured artists once a month, October through May, where we can have an evening for our community and listen to some great music. We've along the dance studio and community space put pictures of all of our students so we can remind ourselves as we're in here what Darlington truly is to the community. Now on our walls through November is Meg Lemure, who's a fantastic artist from the Philadelphia area. She has a vivacious outlook on life, which is something that is totally needed right now. You can find her artwork both online at darlingtonarts.org, or you can come in and see the art from nine to nine Monday through Friday and nine to four on Saturdays. We recognize that this is a difficult time for many of our families, both here already at Darlington and those that may be thinking about coming to Darlington. We are proud of our Agape Fund, which can help for scholarship assistance for music, art, dance, and drama classes for any of our students that have the passion and the worth to do the lessons or the classes, but may not have the financial means. To check that out, you can go to darlingtonarts.org and go under our scholarships tab. One of the more unique things that Darlington Arts Center can offer is our expansive grounds. We were given five acres from Concord Township in 2000 to build the art center on our space, but we've decided to maintain the greenery here. So in Darlington's next steps, we're hopeful that in the next few years, we'll have a nature trail and benches around our perimeter so that our students and community members alike can enjoy the outside as well as the inside of Darlington. On behalf of our board of directors, staff and teaching artists, I'd like to thank you for joining us on our virtual tour today. Please know that we're here in person from nine to nine, Monday through Friday and nine to four on Saturdays. If you'd like to come in for a personal tour, or to check out the activities that we have going on. And as always, look for us online at www.darlingtonarts.org. Thanks. So this is Jen. For those of you uh, keeping track at home, that was outfit four for me. <laughs> I keep it real. Uh, we're gonna be moving into my hometown, Jared. So we're going into Havertown right now, oh, where nice. I was born and raised. Other side uh, of the county. There's a really wonderful uh, advocacy group there called HCAN, and they have an arts advocacy, advocacy unit. And um, we're gonna hear from Teresa Browngold, who's one of their artists right now, uh, who's exhibiting uh, deliberate compassion. So we're gonna go to our investigative arts reporter, Jennifer K. Hoff, Delco's Finest. Delco's Finest. Good evening, everyone. We are uh, very fortunate this evening to have uh, Teresa Brown Gold with us. She is a documentary portrait painter and a part of HCAN's exhibit, uh, Deliberate Compassion. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, how did your vision for art as social inquiry develop? I have been in the restaurant business, uh, actually retired from that business a few years ago, but I started at 19. And so I have, I have actually met and spoke to hundreds of thousands of people. So when my husband and I owned our own business, I got into the idea of what business is and very quickly realized that I was not going to be happy doing that. So I started taking, I studied art in my twenties, but I started taking art classes at uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and, you know, two, those two um, forces merged. And one day I had this epiphany because I, people told me they got so indignant when um, uh, something about access to health care or some political, they deemed political issue. I never saw it as political. But, and then at the same time, they wanted donations for the SPCA or whatever. And I thought, wow, there seems to be a disconnect here. So I was 
doing art, loving the portrait classes that I was taking. And this epiphany happened in my head. I said, you know, what if I started connecting the issue to real people? And so instead of people having this opinion that was floating out there, that they would actually see a face and say, well, this is how it looks in real life. And that, that's how it started when I had my own business. And this was about 2008. Wow, that's a great story. That's oh, good. Uh, how did deliberate compassion come about? Well, that was a personal journey. So people tend to hear that phrase and think, oh, I have to feel something for somebody else. But actually the journey, what we feel toward another person, another story, another situation is really an outgrowth of this expansion that we have inside ourselves, which happened to me. So imagine now years, I'm interviewing people, you do it, you get it. I'm just erasing myself. I need to connect to you. I need to feel your soul. So I'm not gonna bring my personal opinions to anything. So I erase myself and I get into the habit of deep listening. And years into this, as I said, I had, I realized that that deep listening became a habit, deliberate. It was a habit and I was applying it to myself. I was listening to that, my own inner voice in a more compassionate, calm, quiet way. And because I was kinder to myself, I felt this sort of evolution of my own being. And I felt um, connected. I could understand what another person was going through because I could kind of see it in myself. Um, and I started having compassion deeper compassion. I mean, we have to be, people, artists, I think, have to be compassionate and connect and empathetic. But this deep, profound connection to all human life happened. And that's where the deliberate compassion, it happened in myself because I made a habit of deliberately putting myself in a position of listening and wanting to connect. And I think if we try to connect to others, no agenda just listen, we end up take, we end up benefiting the most. Right, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, what is the role of the arts and social justice issues for you? Well, for me, it's a way to get people interested in the subject that they might be afraid of, uncomfortable with. They might hear a lot of yelling and screaming. The portraits don't yell back. It's a very soft invitation in to say, hey, look, can we have a conversation and can we start just by looking at somebody else's life? And from there, when once people relax, once they tense up, they're getting their you know defenses up. But once they relax, they might say, oh, that's what my girlfriend's mother was saying when she you know, had that pre-existing condition before healthcare reform and she couldn't get insurance and she was 59 years old and too or young to qualify for. So that's a gent, for me, it's a gentle way, a more gentle way, but it could be a wolf in sheep's clothing in the sense that there can, there, there's internal um, discord. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my goodness, I'm connecting to something that I had this harsh opinion about and now I feel different. But the project can walk us through that. Right. I don't leave you hanging. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now a bit of personal. Okay. What's your favorite art form if it weren't portrait painting? And do you have any collections of, of art that you want to share with us? You know, do you collect anything? Well, I, um, I actually started an Instagram account, less for myself and more for art. I don't put anything political on there or uh, it's all, I look at art. I look at all the museums. I look at art in um, gardens. I look at everything. So everything is art to me. Um, it's hard to say beyond painting my favorite because it's just, I just get so sucked into everybody's art, especially if it's oil paint. Um, well, there you go. Love the oil paints, the richness of it, love working with them and all of that. It's funny, I actually, my husband likes to go to the thrift stores to find cookbooks. People don't use cookbooks anymore and they're ending up in the thrift stores and they're pretty cool because he's been a chef his whole life um, and, and working in the food business since he was 14. So I look for art books, but I also look for signed prints, signed 
photographs. I love all of that. Um, as I, as our lives progress, I'm looking forward to buying even more expensive art. Um, my teachers at PAFA were fantastic. I have friends that do fantastic artwork. Um, so, you know, I see myself buying more of that. Now you're getting into the several hundreds and thousands of dollars, but um, we're, we're getting there, you know. Right. The old illustrations and books are pretty fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. I'm capt captivated by all of it really. Because, you know, seeing as an artist, um, and it's training, I mean, I see shapes, I see the frenetic activity between two colors that come together, I, I respond to it. And that's only because I'm in the studio uh, looking for the same vibe, you know, maybe if I want to accomplish that. So I'm, it's a technical thing, I'm thinking about it. So when I see it outside my own work, I'm like, whoa, wow, look how they did that. Mm. They did that with a line and, and this color, you know, so it, it all is exciting to me. That's spectacular. Well, I'm super appreciative of you being a, a part of Delco Arts Week uh, this year. And uh, please uh, stay around and come back and see us soon. I will do that. And thanks so much, Jennifer. I loved it. Thank you. All right. If you want to see more of Teresa Brown Gold's beautiful collection, I. I I cannot, I cannot even express to you, like I, Jared, you know this, I, I love, I love Delco art so much, but like I fangirled over Teresa Brown Gold during were, that whole piece. You. I was like, it's so good. So if you go to h-can.org slash arts advocacy, or you can do, go to delcoarts.org um, and either find it on a list of events, or you can go under the members docket and find hcan arts advocacy there. Uh, it's really worth the time. There's a beautiful video and a wonderful collection with a beautiful message that we all need right now in Havertown. In Havertown. Well, let's let's keep it over on that side of the county <laughs> and uh, check it out over at, at what's going on down in the Lansdowne Symphony, Symphony Orchestra with conductor Ruben Blundell. And we'll also check out what's going on at the with Harry Deitzler, too. Yeah, over at the Oud Pack with Harry. There we go. Hi, this is Eric Thompson from Darlington Arts Center so celebrating great. Double Arts Week as we take our tour. We're going to the Lansdowne region, the Upper Darby Lansdowne region now, where we have Ruben Blundell from the Lansdowne Symphony Orchestra. Welcome, Ruben. Hello, Eric. Hello. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, it's weird to be seeing you this way, but it's uh, I'm excited that we're being able to do this. How has pandemic been treating you? Well, I've been busier than just about ever um, because the, one of the projects that, that I've been doing with the Lansdowne Symphony is this performance that we are doing in October. And typically last year, we began rehearsals for it in September. This year, we began planning for it in late July. Wow. So, you know, cr creating a, a track that the musicians can play with, um, giving the musicians time to practice, learn their music, and, re and record their parts, receive those parts over a matter of weeks, um, and then splice them together, uh, layer them together in, uh, it, it's a very different process. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, we've definitely had to adapt and I, I'm really excited to see what the, the orchestra has in store for Double Arts Week, but also for the remainder of the season. It's gonna be very exciting. Um, Ruben, I, I saw, I've done my research, so I saw that you've been with the Lansdowne Symphony Orchestra as the music director since 2014. What is it about Lansdowne Symphony that keeps you there? What do you love about it? Well, it's, they're fantastic players. It's a, an orchestra with a great deal of musical talent. You know, there are members of the orchestra that have done, some of them done advanced music degrees. Um, our concertmaster is a retired member of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Harold Klein. Um, and uh, there's this great culture of uh, long-term commitment to great music making um, that, you know, some of that uh, comes from just the, the orchestra's long-term commitment to excellence. I mean, there, it's a 75-year-old, this is our 75th anniversary this year. Um, Congratulations. The, yes, the, the previous um, music director um, was uh, also a member of the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, Mr. Ludwig, and, and I know that he instilled in the players a great deal of a real commitment to great music making. And I've been able to work with the musicians and the board to, to build on this and play ever more um, 
uh, you know, a varied and interesting repertoire um, in concerts with an increasing orchestra at the Upper Derby Performing Arts Centre, where we've um, where we always feel welcome um, from that uh, wonderful organization, you know, led by Harry Dietzler, who's just fantastic as I think everyone in Delco knows. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, he's, we're all big fans of Harry Dietzler. Um, Ruben, if, if you weren't a conductor, if you weren't a music director, is there another art type of art form that you uh, lean towards or would be passionate about? I've been learning a lot about video arts of late. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gosh, you know, my grandfather and his twin brother were wildlife photographers in the Pacific Northwest. Don't let the accent fool you. I was born in Australia, but, but half of my family is, are Americans uh, on the West Coast mainly. Um, and so they, they took these incredible, the Spring brothers, took these incredible photographs, sometimes uh, as their clients included Alaskan Airlines, um, and the state of Washington, the state of Alaska, they were travel photographers a lot of the time. My grandmother wrote books. Um, so there were, uh, I, I love photography. I don't have anything more sophisticated than, than a camera that also uh, answers telephone calls. But uh, I, I, do love, I do love being able to frame things and sort of see how they come together from different perspectives and angles. And there are a lot of uh, great places in the uh, Delaware County area that are really good to photograph. Well, that's a good segue. So we're here, in, we're here in Delaware County. You know, I'm born and raised in Delaware County. You are not, which is totally okay. But, um, you know, we take, we have a great amount of pride in Delco. So what's, what, what in Delaware County is wonderful for you? Well, I, you know, there, one of the highlights of my year is, um, to work with um, uh, Ms. Benglian's choir at the Upper Derby High School. Um, this is an, when they all come together, there are 200 high school students singing their hearts out. Um, and when we sing the Hallelujah Chorus or whatever other pieces that we sing together with them, it's just thrilling because these young people, are, they love music so much, they love their teachers so much. Um, the, it, it, and to know that these young people are a part of Delaware County and the future is great. That's a, that's a really exciting thing about, about Delco that, that, um, that, I, that I really love. And, uh, and it's also so beautiful, you know, I, whether it's, um, you know, heading towards Newton Square, the beautiful trees and the um, downtown uh, Lansdowne is beautiful. I recommend everybody visit that wonderful sycamore tree, um, which I could stand to do a few more photographs of. I think. <laughs> it is a great spot. I love the name drops you're having. I think there's going to be a lot of people in our audience that will be shaking their head when you mentioned Barbara Begley. She's, she is a Delco idol, I believe. Um, you know, after this interview, we're going to be going into a clip of what uh, Lansdowne Symphony Orchestra is offering to uh, our audience is for Delco Arts Week. Can you speak a little bit on the the piece and where it came, why it's so important? Well, at, at the beginning of the summer, there was the, the terrible, the murder of George, George Floyd. Um, we are at this, you know, there are a lot of crises going on at the moment, but, but one of them that's been going on for centuries is the uh, disadvantages placed uh, on people of color. Um, so the LSO, you know, in this limited time where we're not able to get together, you know, we, we had already been looking at the equity of the pieces that we perform. Um, one of our projects that's currently kind of on pause is a, 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 our, our second compact disc, which will be all pieces of music by female composers that have not been released commercially on CDs before. Um, the first CD was a big success. Uh, that was all music by Romantic Era, American composers. Um, but this, this next one I was very excited about too. And it was in co conjunction with uh, Philadelphia's Fleischer Collection. Um, but we don't do enough pieces by composers of color and a great piece by a classical era composer, because I knew that we, our resources, our rehearsal, our number of plays that we can that can 
currently play was going to be limited. I chose a piece for chamber orchestra, um, which we had incidentally, you know, the size of the orchestra that we had used for Delco Arts Week last week, last year. Um, and so we did this, we're doing this symphony by a fellow named Joseph Bologna. Uh, he was called the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, which means the Knight of Saint-Georges. It's a family name that he had from his, from his father, who was a white aristocratic planter in Guadeloupe. And um, St. George's mother was an enslaved woman. Um, and he had this improbable story, which is being made into yet another movie that's supposed to come out with, with uh, Disney's Searchlight Pictures in the next couple of, next, well, it was supposed to be released this year. Um, and uh, so it's an improbable journey. He ends up in Paris. He is music director of an orchestra. He is a successful violin soloist. Not only that, he is a competitive, you'd think there was a twin, because he's also a competitive fencer. Uh, he becomes the first black colonel in the French, um, in the French military. He, we think he was friends with Marie Antoinette, um, may have taught music privately to the queen. Um, just an incredible story. And it's a great classical symphony. And he did share, briefly, he shared um, living quarters with Mozart around the time that Mozart composed his Paris Symphony, which is also a great piece. Um, you know, sometimes uh, St. George is called the Black Mozart. I prefer not to call him that because certainly at that time, Mozart really wanted to be the white St. George and pick up some of those kind of gigs in, in Paris that St. George had. He, Mozart's trip to Paris was unsuccessful. He didn't speak French. I don't know if much has changed since the 1770s, but you really need to try when you go to Paris. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, I'm excited to hear it. If, we want, if you want to see the full performance, it's going to be on decoarts.org. But right now we're going to see just a little taste of this beautiful piece from the Lance House of the Orchestra. Ruben, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, here we go. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure of being here with Harry Dietzler of the Upper Derby Performing Arts Center today. And we're gonna have a casual conversation with Harry and uh, get to know all of his greatness and what he does in Delaware County. So thanks, Harry, for being with us this evening. My and, pleasure. Uh, let's get right to it. Um, how did you come to be at the Upper Derby Performing Arts Center? Well, this beautiful building was built in about 1974 and uh, sat empty every summer. And I was in college, uh, 1976, and kind of had this idea of, of starting a summer theater. I went to the mayor, a group of us got together with a proposal and that's how Summer Stage started back then. So for many summers, we, we did um, Summer Stage in the summers and then went back to our school or jobs or whatever we were doing. Um, in 1985, I took the opportunity to work with the Upper Derby Recreation Department full time and uh, said to my boss, what do you want me to do? He says, start some programs. So 
Um, again, this building was here um, and we kind of took over from an organization called the Upper Darby Forum, which was a community organization that brought in um, really wonderful artists like Robert Merrill and Victor Borga. They would bring them into the Beverly Hills Middle School. They were outgrowing that. So um, when the, the uh, larger Upper Darby Auditorium was built, they moved in there and, and brought in these kind of artists. So about 1988, we took over that kind of idea of bringing in outside artists um, we started working with the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Ballet, and we've been doing that for 30 years, doing a Nutcracker. Um, we started a relationship with the Lansdowne Symphony and uh, also brought in different artists, uh, touring artists, the Irish tenors, the Chinese acrobats, um, and it's, it's grown since then. That's great. If you had an estimate, uh, and sorry to put you on the spot, how many uh, young people have gone through the Upper Derby uh, program? I, I don't know. I thought about that before. <clears throat> we we started out in early years with 400. Now we're up to about 800 per summer. A lot of them repeat. They, some of them are here for 10 years. So it's hard, but there are thousands of, of kids that have come through summer stage. Fantastic. Fantastic. What's the most important thing about the Upper Derby Performing Arts Center for you? I, I think the accessibility. I, I call us an entry-level performing arts center. Um, sometimes the Kimmel Center is uh, a big step for people price-wise, uh, travel-wise, parking. There's a lot of obstacles to getting down there to the Academy of Music or down in Philadelphia. So I like to think that we're, we're close by, we're affordable, um, it's easy parking. And for some people, if it's their first time to bring their kid to see the Nutcracker or to, to you know, for someone to see an orchestra, um, it, it's an easy first step. So that's what I hope we are. That's fantastic. What are the role of the arts in education? Well, one of the roles is that the, the arts speak to our heart. Um, you know, everything about education, not everything, but, um, you know, the sciences and history and um, English to an extent, it's, it's theoretical and it's, you know, it, it's the mind. Mm -hmm. The arts speak to our heart and the arts also um, unify us. We have this wonderful event every year at Upper Darby School District called our gala. And we literally have 700 kids uh, take turns on our stage. And when you look at the groups, um, they come from 80 some different nationalities in our school district. They all sing together the same language. But whatever country they're from, they can make music and they can communicate together that way. So. I think the arts unify our schools. They also allow the kids that expression um, of the joy and everything, the emotions in their hearts. So um, that's what it brings to our schools, that's heart and, and unification. That's great. Now a bit of the personal. What's your favorite art form? Any collections that you have? A anything? Um, well, I, I'm a musician. I studied music. I went to Temple. Uh, I was a music major and taught music at O'Hara for, for six years. And uh, I play the piano. I've um, I had wonderful opportunities at Temple to sing in the choir with the Philadelphia Orchestra. We sang the Verdi Requiem at Carnegie Hall. And so I, I love classical music. Um, I don't listen to it as much as I wish I could, but I also play piano. I've uh, done a lot of Broadway shows and enjoy that music. But lately I've been trying to learn um, jazz and um, get back to playing um, kind of cocktail music. So, uh, B.G. Adair is a new artist that I've discovered. She's a, uh, a jazz pianist, but um, very accessible place that the uh, Great American Songbook and does it in a real easy way. So, um, so music is my first love. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you being here with us this evening. Uh, thank you for all you do for Delaware County and the arts for our young people and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Ruben. Those were really wonderful examples what we have. If you wanna hear more about uh, Upper Darby Performing Arts Center, you can go to udpac.org and see what they have uh, events that are coming up and you can also join their mailing list. What? Dietzler, right? Dietzler. Dietzler. Okay. Yes, Dietzler. Jared is sorry. Sorry, Jared. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> I love the sweater. Yeah, well, you know, seven. Seven outfit changes today. <laughs> Thank you very much.
I have to do some laundry. Um, we're going to take you on our last leg of this tour tonight. Uh, we're going to go over to Chad's Ford, to the Brandywine River Museum, and then down to Wallingford, just down Route 1. That's right down. To the Community Arts Center with Paul Downey. Hi, everyone. This is Eric Thompson from Darlington Arts Center coming at the U.S. for our tour for Double Arts Week. And we're seeing my neighbor right now for in uh, Chad's Ford. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Amanda Burden from the Brandywine River Museum of Art. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. I love the background. We're getting a little glimpse of the yeah. uh, of what we're what we can speak on today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, Dr. Burden, would you mind just letting uh, our, our friends know what what your role is at the River Museum and what you've been doing over there. Sure, absolutely. Well, um, I am a curator at the Brandywine and I've been there for over eight years now. And um, so my role there is to come up with the ideas for the exhibition, as well as take care of the art that's in our collection already. So in this past summer and still going on right now, I've had a couple of exhibitions on view, even while we were closed for COVID um, and made those virtual. So that was a new challenge for us. Um, but we are open to the public again. So we're back to our wonderful um, in-person visits. Uh, and some of these exhibitions are still on view. That's exciting. And, you know, we want to talk about one particular exhibition that we're, uh, that you guys have featured this week. If we could um, just talk about the, the Witness to History uh, with Stephen Summerstein, how that came about, how that idea came to you, and um, what was the process like? Yeah, so the exhibition is called Witness to History. Of, uh, it's the Selma Photography of Stephen Summerstein. Um, it is photographs that all took place on the very last day, they were all taken on the very last day of the final march between Selma and Montgomery, Alabama in March of 1965. The reason we um, looked into having an exhibition like this, um, we don't do a lot of photography exhibitions, but it was to be a companion to an exhibition we had earlier this year called Votes for Women, A Visual yeah. History. So that exhibition was in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. But of course, as we think about and understand how the 19th Amendment actually functioned, we know that a lot of people, a lot of women were left out of enfranchisement, even though the constitutional amendment had happened. And it took until 1965 with a, uh, an act of legislation called the Voting Rights Act of 1965 for especially African-American citizens, especially in the South, to have access to the same voter registration and voting rights. And so this exhibition about this particular march is all about reaching out and asking for, demanding one's right to vote. So the two exhibitions about voting and voting history went together. How appropriate for our current state of things going on in the country. Yeah. Um, was uh, Mr. Was Stephen Summerstein? Was he involved uh, directly? How How was it working with him? Well, it, it was amazing. I don't get to, um, you know, I'm an art historian, so I don't get to work with too many living artists. So right. it's always fantastic when you can pick up the phone and call one and say, "Hey, when you did this image, what were you thinking? You know, when you when you took this shot." How did you think it was gonna turn out? And so I've had many hours of conversations with Stephen Summerstein, who's retired now. And I think the most fascinating thing that I learned about him was the fact that even though he took these photographs when he was a college student, when he was working for the City College newspaper in New York, he didn't go on to be a professional photographer or, or journalist or a documentary photographer. He's a physicist. He was um, involved with the um, Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysics Lab and uh, Lockheed Martin, and he had a full career in physics. And only after he retired did he start going back and looking at some of the things he's done, especially in photography over the years, and kind of brought these photos out of relative hiding after 50 years or more. That's amazing. And you know, it's it's a wonderful inspiration for many of us that have our day to day and then maybe take on an arts, uh, the arts as a hobby. This is something that can come through. Yeah. You know, this is, 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, when I talked to him, I, he, he had always had an interest in photography and he's taken photographs all his life, but hadn't considered himself, you know, an artist uh, in terms of getting a gallery or a dealer or something like that. But, you know, now in his retirement, he is an exhibiting artist. That's amazing. <laughs> You know, and it's been 55 years since the Voting Rights Act and uh, the, the march. And, you know, you've mentioned the 100th anniversary of Votes for Women and the 19th Amendment. Um, was using, was determining these uh, collections, was it part of an intention to bring in um, uh, uh, a focus on social justice and the voting rights, especially in this year when we're in a pretty contentious election. I know. This, you know, it, it, that's the way election years work out, right? This 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. It's also the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, which is the one that allowed African-American men to vote. So it's a lot of anniversaries lining up here in a row. And, you know, when I talk about Stephen Summerstein's exhibition, it, it's called Witness to History, and he talks about, um, and we'll talk about in a program, about his, his role in looking at history unfolding in front of him. And I think this is a great um, parallel to today where we are literally all witnessing history, and it's through our television screens or our computer screens, sometimes in the real world this summer. Um, and it was an intentional choice. As I said, we were celebrating the 19th Amendment, but wanting to make sure that it, it, its full story was understood, that Native American women didn't gain voting rights, that Chinese American women didn't gain voting rights, African American women had incredible uh, obstacles to overcome. So it was a, a concerted effort to tell the, the main story of suffrage, but also bring new light to that, and then connect that to the 20th century, and, and as it turned out, to our present moment in, in election and voting rights history. Does the Brandywine have any intention to continue on this journey and bringing, marrying the arts with social justice in their in future exhibitions? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, you know, it, it's something we are just trying out and it seems to have a great response. I mean, people that wouldn't necessarily be art museum goers are interested in a topic. And so one of the exhibitions that I'm working on for next summer will have an aspect of it that is about the use of the atomic bomb and the, um, the kind of deadly um, humanitarian situation that the invention of that atomic bomb brought. It's not the main thrust of the exhibition. It's, a, it's an artist named Ralston Crawford who worked for the military but was an artist. And so he faced these kind of challenges of making the war machine work, but then also witnessing firsthand the destruction that it brought with the nuclear bomb as part of his role in the military. So some of these questions are going to be coming up as well. And we're working on going through our collection and thinking more thoughtfully about, for instance, in the Andrew Wyeth galleries, mm -hmm. there are a number of local African-American subjects that are figured, pictured, but we, we've been looking at this object solely as works by Andrew Wyeth and not pieces of history of our local community. And so we're gonna be, and we are doing the research to learn the lives of these um, black residents around Chad's Ford and bring that to our label. So not just a special exhibition, but also in our regular um, gallery spaces, you'll be hearing different stories in the near future. That's really exciting to know about. I, I look forward to all of these expositions and learning more about the art that's been up. Um, Dr. Burden, you know, you're in a building on the daily that is wonderfully inspirational. I wonder if there's uh, a section of the collection or if there are a couple pieces that you just keep going back to to kind of reflect during your day. There is one corner of our first floor gallery that I kind of have made it my special mission to be to make it um, a rotating selection of women illustrators. Um, because of course, when you're in our galleries, you're really surrounded by some of the greatest works of illustrators, period. But the voices or the visuals of N.C. Wyeth and Howard Pyle tend to dominate. What's so fascinating is that Howard Pyle was very equalitarian when it came to teaching, and he taught many women artists. And so I've staked out this piece of real estate in the galleries <laughs> to, to, to show the continuing story and of, of women artists as they developed in this profession. 
And so when I, I go to that section, it's often re- I'm often reminded that not only were these women struggling in the same ways to improve their artistic abilities and their talents and to get commissions and jobs that the men were doing, but it's a little bit like that that quote where it said Ginger Rogers does everything that Fred Astaire does, but she does it backwards in heels. Yes. Well, (laughs) all these women artists were also facing the discrimination, the gender discrimination of that illustration marketplace and of the art educational world. So they had this um, sort of double-edged sword that they were working against of getting their talent and their training up to the same level that was expected of men, and then also convincing um, the customer, so to speak, in the world of illustration that they were able to do it as well. So I like to go there, and it's a little inspirational when, yeah. you know, my day's well, not going so well. <laughs> that's great, and now we can be on the lookout when we come to visit as well. Um, can you give a little plug? Do you have the hours that we can come visit the Brandy Wine? Yes. So the Brandywine uh, reopened to the public in July. We still have a really robust online program if you're not feeling comfortable yet, but we are open to the public every day but Tuesdays, and we open at 10 a.m., and we are open until 4 p.m., and you can go on our website or call our front desk and make reservations because we do have limited admissions every day, so we have no more than 40 people in the whole museum. It's really like having a museum to yourself. That's wonderful. And there's a beautiful outdoor space, too, if you need to take in some nature as well. It's a uh, wonderful space on the edge of Delaware County. Dr. Burden, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Right after this, we're going to see a little snippet of the virtual conversation for Witness to History, um, which is available in its full capacity on DelcoArts.org. And uh, Dr. Burden, how long is Witness to History open uh, if we wanted to come to the museum? Well, it closes on November 1st. And um, I'd like to think of that as almost right up until election day. So if you're thinking about voting, go see this. You'll be inspired. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time. And thank you for all the work that you're doing to bring this to light. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening. Uh, This evening we are joined by Paul Downey of the Community Arts Center. Paul, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, We'll just get through these questions. Uh, What do you love about the Community Arts Center? The people. Uh, There's a lot of things that I love about the Arts Center, but that's that's most definitely the the biggest one. Um, I've been here for about 10 years and uh, the the relationships that I, I feel personally are, are are huge, but also it's what I love about what I see here on a daily basis. Um, you know, we're all artists, and, we, and uh, we've been that's what we do here. But um, uh, the relationships that get built around the art are really what I think is so inspiring. Um, and also, uh, not just the relationships between people, but the way you see people um, uh, learn about themselves and grow into who they're becoming as a result of, of um, doing the art. So that's the biggest one to me. Um, I also love the old buildings because I'm a fan of uh, yesteryear <laughs> and uh, coming to uh, to work in an 1889 mansion every day is very pleasant to me. <laughs> Sounds very, very pleasant. Uh, tell me about your transition from a working artist painting murals to being an executive director. How, how is that uh, transformation? Well, it was totally unplanned, uh, but it, it has gone... Um, very well. Um, I, I I guess I would start by just saying a couple short things about you know what I did before coming here. Um, as a young man, I was blessed to make my living uh, playing drums and painting large scale murals. And you know, there's a lot worse paths you can take. So um, I did work nonstop, but it was it was a lot of fun. Um, 
I actually got involved with the art center. Um, so I, I used to do a lot of work for mural arts and other private you know, projects, but I got involved with the art center by doing um, uh, a sort of by accident. We began to paint murals um, through the art center's act, outreach program um, in, in Chester. Um, it, I say by accident because we, we didn't really set out to do a program per se. We uh, I was going to facilitate a little weekend project and we ended up doing a small mural and then people were positive about it. And so we continued the work and, and built on it. Um, and honestly, um, the, the one project that we did in Chester, uh, was probably one of the most meaningful things I've ever done in my life. We, uh, uh many people are unaware, but Martin Luther King went to seminary in Chester and we did a mural commemorating his time there uh, at the church where he gave his first official sermon after becoming ordained. Yeah, so that was a real honor um, and, and to, to be invited to do that. And um, sort of throughout the years um, of doing mural projects, I became um, you know close with the organization mm -hmm. and, and close friends with the former director. Uh, and then uh, it just so happened that the program director was leaving and um, she asked me if I wanted to come work here, and, and I did. That was Debbie Yoder, who was a, a real mentor to me. Um, and then, again, I had not ever planned to be the executive director of anything, I'll be totally honest. That was not something I imagined as a young man uh, happening. Um, and, but uh, after uh, the organization, you know, uh, uh, started a search. Um, eventually, I, I asked to be considered, and eventually, I, I, I was hired to uh, to be the executive director. Um, and I think it was the the universe made it very clear to me that it was what what I needed to do next. And I, I think that um, uh, it has gone. I think everyone was happy with the decision. <laughs> We're eight years in now, so I you know no one seems really to regret the decision. So. That's great. That's great. Uh, what's your favorite memory of Delaware County in the arts? Uh, I think, um, well, I have, of course, uh, hundreds of great memories here at the Art Center, but I think what I would say is my favorite memory um, is my family. I have a, 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 an 11 year old daughter, and my family, since she was one, uh, we've been going to to Upper Darby Summer Stage Productions. Um, and I think, you know, collectively, those experiences are, are my greatest memories of Del Del Delaware County Arts. Maybe if I was pressed, Jennifer, to be more specific, I would say specifically the main stage production of, um, uh, of Mary Poppins a few years ago. That's great. Uh, out of this world, yeah. Mary Diesler will be very happy to hear that. Yeah, well, Harry is uh, a real hero of mine. Yeah, yep, as he should be. Uh, what's your dream drumming gig? Wow. Um, well, <laughs> that's an interesting one. You know, I've played drums in <laughs> just about every imaginable strange situation you can think of. Um, you know, it's fun to play on big stages in front of big crowds. And, um, you know, I used to, I think, again, when we're younger, we, we think that's like the, the goal. And so, but um, honestly, after 25 years of playing music, uh, the dream, the dream gigs are just anywhere where there's people who want to share in a positive experience with you, you know? on stage and off stage. Um, nowadays, my most fun gigs are during the day, places where families can be and my daughter can be there, you know? Um, but most of it's fun, but uh, yeah, uh, that, I, that's how I would describe the, the dream gig, I guess. That's great, that's great. Well, Paul, thanks so much for being with us this evening. Super appreciative, uh, super appreciative of your role in the arts in Delaware County and your participation in Delco Arts Week. Well, thank you. It is my pleasure and my uh, privilege to, to be involved in the arts here. So thanks for your time. All right, have a good one.
Our thanks, our big thanks to Paul Downey from Community Arts Center and Dr. Burden from Brandywine River Art Museum. You can go to brandywine.org to see the rest of the exhibit for visual history, uh, witness to history. It is an amazing place. And then Paul Downey uh, and the Community Arts Center has uh, on Friday, or tomorrow, that's tomorrow, this week has been so great that I keep forgetting <laughs> what day it is. Uh, tomorrow they're doing a uh, art exhibition that you can actually go to in person. You just need to call the Community Arts Center to set up a reservation. It is the George Rothacre Show. And then they're doing their Potter's Guild pop-up sale on Saturday. And I'm also gonna plug Paul's band, which is playing next Thursday at Sherry Punjab in Media, Pennsylvania. Jared, thanks for the shirt, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's the best at promoing everybody. It looks <laughs> right. You know? That's nine costume you give him a changes. You give him a T-shirt. He'll toss it on right I'm, away. I'm all Rockdale now. This is great. This is it. We got a convert. We got a convert over here. All so. right. Well, we got our friends now from coming from Havertown, Tom Kelly at the Kelly Center, and Jennifer Hoff, the uh, arts investigative reporter, Douglas Finest in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. Guys, this has been such a fun so, night touring the county. Congratulations! This was this was a great this was a great show, and and I and I really appreciate you inviting me to be part of it. Um, if I might do a little plugging myself here for what's going on at the Kelly Center as we wrap up Delco Arts Week. Uh, first of all, the walls of the Kelly Center are a gallery every single month. We have an artist of the month this week, or I'm sorry, this month we have a terrific uh, artist from Delaware County by the name of Dina Ball, who has a lot of watercolor. She has a dozen watercolor arts. Um, paintings on the wall. Uh, and, if, and also, if you are a local artist and you're interested in displaying your work in the Kelly Center, reach out to us via email. You can reach us at kellymusicforlife at gmail.com. Right now, we're booked through February, but we're lining up local artists uh, going forward. Tomorrow night here at the Kelly Center, we're featuring the music of Delco, all Delco artists live on our stage from the Kelly Center and a couple from home. Scott McClatchy, Peaks Pammy Cobal, Vincent James, Chris McGee, and Kate Asirin will be performing tomorrow night. I and then it. Saturday, we have a Family Oktoberfest, which is an outside event on the Foley School grounds at 300 East Eagle Road in Havertown. Pumpkin decorating, food, crafts, uh, beer and wine garden, and a music tent with live performances from Chico, Dennis Chiquino, John Byrne, Virginia Sherno Jennings, and a whole lot more. So. If you need any more information on what we're up to, go to kellycenter.org. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Jennifer, do you know what's going on in Lansdowne on Delco Arts Week? Uh, I do, but everyone should check the website at delcoarts.org. Tom, uh, Jared, and Eric, I can't thank you enough. Uh, what, a, what a great representation of the arts in Delaware County. Uh, you three for being here this evening and the interviewees. Um, and all the events. So uh, check out the website. And because a lot of it is virtual, uh, we'll be moving a lot of it to our YouTube page so you can uh, have an evergreen place to see all the content. But what a variety and what a great uh, representation of Delaware County this evening. Really appreciate you guys. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks for all your hard work getting this together. Um, our thanks to Rockdale Music and studios for hosting us over here and for Jared, who stepped in front of the camera but was supposed to be behind the camera today as the engineer here. You know, I can be the talent too. Yeah. I can be the talent over here. here. I can be a little bit of talent too. We think we're gonna take this show yeah, yeah. on a permanent schedule. <laughs> Guys, just you wait, it's gonna be amazing. You know? uh, have a wonderful evening. Check out depoarts.org. There's still so much to do this weekend and still so much to see. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Be well. Be well.